Celebrate 50 years of the Dubliners on for one night only. It's been 25 years since we did the famous Late Late with Gay. And would you believe we're heading into our 50th year very soon. So we're still going strong. It's a miracle to me that the group are still going on the eve of their 50th anniversary and that I am still standing up straight and ready to talk to them. For any Dubliner fan, it is a must. Hunt ahead and turn them down the rocky road and all the ways to double and make fall all the time. There's a little snoot, I tell you, lots of fun at getting in the way. And still I live in hopes to see the holy ground. After 50 years, for one night only, it's the Dubliners! Good to see you, sir. Yes. Good to see you. Now, welcome. As a matter of interest, why did you start with that number? 
Uh, that particular, the tunes there, yeah. I just get a bit of jizz into the evening, you know, get, give them a bit of a rouser to start. Yeah. You know? It's a well-tried war horse, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it occurred to me that the band, one way or another, I know there have been <laughs> ferocious changes of personnel, but we're celebrating the 50th year. The band changes, but the tunes go on and the songs go on. Yeah, well, the, the tunes and the, 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 the new members bring in some new repertoire as well, you know, mm. which freshens up the thing again. And then you try them out on audiences and... That's right. A live, we, we, every night is a live rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> right? Do you know that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've every, heard all the mistakes. Uh, every night is a live rehearsal. Yeah, we, we, we only have an annual rehearsal, really. <laughs> a formal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me this. You were the driver of the band for years. You were the only one who was sober enough to, yes, to actually yeah. drive the band. Yes. Yeah. And, and were, were there arguments about the way you drove? Were there fights about that? Were there fights not, about directions or really. where you the, were going? The main, the main problem really was getting them out of the pub to get home. <laughs> yes. Because I, I still had my good day job in the ESB then, you see, so I was always anxious to get home at a reasonable hour. But I remember one night, actually, we were down at Tipperary, and uh, I was trying to get the bar closed. It was going on and on, one for the road, one for the road. <laughs> so eventually, I thought I hit on a good trick. I tipped the barman a fiver. And I said, close the bar after the next round. The bar didn't close after the next round, or the next one after that. So Ronnie was sitting beside me on the way home, and I said, he was some chancer, that, that guy. I gave him a fiver to close the bar two hours ago. I says, Ronnie, I knew what you were up to. I gave him a tenner to keep it open. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, but, uh, Luke had, had trouble with a sense of direction of some kind, did he? Luke had a ferocious sense of direction. At, at one stage, I remember, he, he seemed to have fallen in love with the, the town of Enniskillen. And it didn't matter where we were going, we could be going to Kerry, Galway, Cork. He'd wake up and he'd say, are we near Enniskillen yet? <laughs> We could be within a mile of Killarney or somewhere <laughs> like that, you know. No sense of direction at all. And I want to start by showing you this little piece of tape because we stitched a couple of different scenes together to bring you a flavour of a well-known song. Roll it there, Alan, please, if you would. To begin the morning, the screw was bawling. Get up, you bellsy, and clean up your cell. And the old triangle When jingles jangle All along the banks Of the Royal Canal <laughs> What are, you, what are you saying, Patsy? What are you I saying? was just wondering that some of the faces there, Charlie Roberts, the man with the Indeed, hat, yes. gay, and uh, yeah. Charlie, yeah, but I just, I, I just seen him doing that. I didn't really know. And, and what, what kind of feelings does, does that bring on when you see things like that? Very sad, actually, really, when I see Luke and Ronnie there, and um, Mick McCarthy. Mick McCarthy, I see yeah. there, and quite a lot of faces. And and, uh, it's really sad when, when, when you look back and see them, God be good some. But uh, just emotional, really, you know? I was with various groups over the years, from 1966, 1967. Bit of solo career with a couple of musicians, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, I was just knocking around playing. I played a lot in America, in all parts of Europe and the whole lot. And then uh, I got a phone call from John one day in 2005, uh, actually, <laughs> to, to know when I go to Austria on tour for, for a couple of gigs, about 10 gigs. And I was over the moon. I was delighted. And I still am. Oh, it was yeah. a pleasure and a dream come true to me, yeah, because my idol, no disrespect to Ronnie or Bob Lynch or Kier, my idol was Luke Kelly. I tell you, and still think to the present day, no disrespect to any other folk singer or any other singer, uh, Luke Kelly to me was the greatest singer I ever heard in my life. He inspired me all my life. And uh, as I said, it was a pleasure to join the Dubliners and uh, it's still a pleasure to be with them. Isn't that a wonderful it is thing the truth to be able there, to say? Though. Yes, and I mean that sincerely. One of the most happy over there with a yeah. great friend of mine. For years, I've had you retired him. <laughs> would you go with that, Eamon? I would indeed. Uh, yeah. You've been you've been now part of the group for uh, 24 years. You were playing I'm jazz. 25 now. You were playing jazz before. <laughs> ah, everything. <yeah. laughs> 
Okay, I, I started off with a uh, Dermot O'Brien, the club man, show band, and we did a concert tour of England in, what, 67? Yeah. They were, the Dubs were managed by Phil Solomons, we were managed by George O'Reilly, and the two, the two acts together, con concert tour, because it was no, it was unheard of, wasn't it? Irish acts mm, doing sure, every, yeah, so the, yeah. the, the bands had ballrooms, the lads had folk clubs, and it was hugely successful. Mm. But I remember the first night, I think the lads opened the first night, we used to swap. And I went out front and I heard Luke singing. And then I heard Ronnie Drew. And I mean, the two voices, you know, Jock and Jeez, but incredible. You know, and I was now rock and roll at that stage. And this just, but then of course I met John and Barney. We, we used to go around borrowing record players. Record you that? players. Yeah, that, that well, winding up record players in the bedroom <laughs> to play each other. <laughs> LPs. <you know. laughs> and I, I, do you remember that? Was Who's sorry now? Who's yeah, sorry now? Yeah, we know it well. Yeah. We know oh, it well. I, I got the, do you remember that play? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about you, Sean? Down, do you still delight in what you do? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it is a great shame that Luke passed away so early in life because we are now septuagenarians, three of us in the group, and his life was cut short in his 40s, and this is a strange lottery of, of life that strange we life. have the privilege of living on to our age. Well, well, what? What, what Barney? We're the geriatric quintet. We are a geriatric quintet. <laughs> yes, yes. No, but we're still making a noise, that's the great thing. Yeah. Well, we, great. Lost, we lost Ronnie three years ago. Yes, indeed. God, God what bless sort you. of things happen, uh, John, to remind any of you of him or remind you of him? Or? Uh, I, was, I was talking to our sound man there, Tom O'Brien. He, he reminded me of a lovely story. Ronnie was coming back from a gig. I think it was during, during his solo career. He used to leave every, every 10 years, was it, Bernie, <laughs> or something like that? He used to, yeah, he'd go chasing a solo career. Pursuing a solo career, you know. So but he, he had a car accident one night and he hit a ditch and the car ended up in the middle of a field. And uh, he ended up in hospital and uh, the sergeant was in the next morning to ask the important questions. And he said, Ronnie, by any chance, was there any drink involved? And Ronnie says, of course there was. What do you think I am, a stunt man or something? <laughs> <laughs> bad career move, John, bad, bad career move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As chairman of the Road Safety Authority. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, <laughs> um, considering my position on that report. <laughs> anyway, you have a poem. You have a poem which yeah. you wrote for Ronnie. I have indeed. Would you yeah. like to say it? First? Okay, I wrote this one a few weeks ago. It's more of a, a sketch of Ronnie than a painting, if you like. But uh, just little glimpses of his character and his personality. I call it a sketch of a Dubliner. Bearded bass boom, slim lined, short fused, razor sharp. Center stage holding forth, center bar toasting life. Disciple of Zosimus flirting with fame, purveyor of street ballad, crafter of storyline. Imbiber of the black stuff, epicenter of the crack, master of retort, outwitting the heckler. Jovial raconteur conjuring with words, precision timing, knockout punchline, grumpy at morning, barbed wire vinegar, convivial at evening, rose without thorns, champion of the underdog, dethroning the haughty, Sounding uncomfortable truths, uplifting the needy. Disenchanted, weary of applause, wary of patronage, impatient for the wings. Distillation of the Liffey, salt of the earth, Dublin personified, Ronnie Drew. That's lovely, John. Yeah. Well done. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> he was he was prickly in the morning, was he? He could be a bit grumpy in the morning, <laughs> all right. But, but, uh, and in the evening as well. <laughs> <laughs> Barney, you're not supposed to say that. But anyway. Listen, I tell you what, we have a little snippet of him in action. 
in O'Donoghue's. Oh, Have lovely. a look at this. Roll it there, Alan, please. Oh, she walks along Fitzgibbon Street with an independent air. And then it's down be Summer Hill. And as the people stare, she says it's nearly half past one. And it's time I had another little one. And a heart down the road with Daisy Riley. But she poor old Daisy Riley, she is taken to the sun. Poor old Daisy Riley, she will never give it up. It's off each morning to the heart. And then she's in for another little drop of the heart. Of the road was Daisy Riley. But she poor old Daisy Riley, she is taken to the sun. Poor old Daisy Riley, she will never give it up. It's off each morning to the heart. How are you, Phelan? Good to see you. Hello, Tina. How are you? This is Phelan, and, and how are you, Desi? Good to see you. I'll, I'll come to you first from O'Donoghue's. I'm, I'm unsure whether you think the Dubliners made O'Donoghue's or O'Donoghue's made the Dubliners? The Dubliners made O'Donoghue's. No doubt in your no mind. No doubt in the wide earthly world. Good man. Good man. Good man. <laughs> I've, just, I've just said hello, ladies and gentlemen, to Phelan and Clea and Drew. And, and you're welcome. How are you both since? Very well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just you know, coping and yeah, missing. this is Absolutely, it, you know. Yeah. That's all you can do, really, isn't it? And, and, and how did the public, Ronnie, compare with Daddy? Um, very much the same, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one thing that anybody who was ever close to him will ever testify to, is that he was always himself. And that's what he was always um, very good at. Uh, he was always very honest. And um, uh, he was very generous. And... Uh, I was just uh, reminded there that the Dubliners going to Australia. I remember I was very young at the time, and uh, they w went on away for what seemed like an eternity. It was about two months, and uh, they went off to Australia, and, uh, and they came back. And I remember he brought me back a book with pictures of Australia and cowboys and, 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 and um, kangaroos and things like that. And, uh, and he'd been to New they'd been to New Zealand as well. And I said to Dad, I said, uh, what was New Zealand like, you know? It's like the other side of the world, and being a young fella as well, like, you know, what was New Zealand like? And he said, he said, well, he said, it was like as if everyone had gone away for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, Cleena, and was he grumpy in the morning and a bit better at night? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there was sort of... The routine, the paper had to be had, and regardless of school or whatever, you were sent down to the paper and whatever. But when he came home from tour and that, he loved, he loved Ireland. He hated travelling. How uh, much did, did the group impinge on your lives growing up? Because it was part of your lives. Yeah, I mean, it, it was something that, you know, I think from, from a very early age, you were aware that, that, that you, were, you, know, you were privileged to be, um, to be part of this family. Um, I, I have very early memories of going to the stadium to see the Dubliners and the, the atmosphere. And I have to say that that's never left me whenever I've witnessed the Dubliners in concert, you know, in the company of, of the lads and uh, with or without Dad. And I have to say that, you know, Dad was always part of the Dubliners and even though he's not there now, even though I can look at the Dubliners now and he's still there in spirit. Yes. Um, and, and, and to hear the Dubliners in concert is always... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experience, and it's something that, you, you know, you have to go to experience because... And it's, it's also, over the years, people would sort of come up to me and well, if they found out that, that I was the son of, 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 of one of the Dubliners, you know, they'd sort of say, oh, the, the enjoyment they gave us. And, you know, all you had to do was sit in, in the audience in a concert in the Olympia um, or, or, you know, in any part of the world and to experience that, that unique uh, performance mm. that they can Good. create. Well, it's lovely to have you both here, and thank you very much indeed for coming. We we'll now do the song which is quintessentially your father's song. And to sing it, we have Patsy, and he is joined by a young man who has flown in here, especially this morning, from America, to be here tonight. And his story is that he saw the 25th birthday celebration on the Late Late Show when he was nine years of age. And the family emigrated to Australia the following year. 
and one of the few things that he insisted on taking with him to Australia and the family was the recording of the Dubliners Late Late Show. So now would you welcome Patsy and Declan O'Rourke. Oh, 
City One Book for Dublin is James Joyce's Dubliners. And of course, they were called Dubliners because Luke was reading the book Dubliners. And I think that the argument for according them freedom of the city, freedom of their own city in 2012 is a compelling one. I just love the Dubliners. song would have to be uh, Ronnie Drew singing the band played Waltzing Matilda. Uh, I saw him sing it a number of times and he sang it with great conviction and great feeling about the futility of war. You're wonderful. Thank you very much. You're terrific. Ladies and gentlemen, please, welcome back for one night only celebrating 50 years of the Dubliners. And for the women of Ireland, especially, this is directed at you. You are about to be serenaded in the most romantic fashion by none other than Mr. Barney McKenna. Yeah. story to tell you I'm telling it under the moon Oh well I wish I had someone to love me Someone to call me her own Someone sleep with me nightly I'm weary of sleeping alone Tonight is our last time together Nearest and dearest must part the love bond that held us together 
shredded and torn all apart. Well, I wish I had someone to love me, like Hela, someone to call me her own, someone to sleep with me. Sleeping alone. I wish I had ships on the ocean, place them with silver and gold. I would sail to the back of my true love, alas. Just nineteen years old. Well, I wish I had someone to love me, someone to call me her own, someone to sleep with me. God save you. Hello. Already, ladies and gentlemen, we've had to call the police to beat the woman away from the front door here in Montrose after that. Barney, well done. Thank you thanks very for, much indeed. Thanks, Kay. Well, why did you choose that song in particular, too? Well, we were traveling around the, around the UK a few years ago, and Sean was playing the tape, and it was too old. Uh, ladies from, I think they were from Scotland, and they were singing it. I liked that little song, and it reminded me of something when I was a child. My grandmother, I think she sang that with a couple of other little songs, and I learned it fairly. I fell for it because it's a little song. It is a love song, but yes. you could sing it as a lullaby. A lullaby, which she sang it to me. And then John's car was robbed. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, oh, Sean, Sean, Sean. Sean, he was driving. Yeah. And I said, Sean, uh, have you got the, the car? I have the tape, he said, because the car was, was robbed. <laughs> and uh, I'm burnt out, and so was the tape. <laughs> <laughs> so? So I had to let, I just remembered it. And, 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 uh, great memory. Yeah. Great I had to, memory. We had to have memories because I was telling them on the program back on the continent there last week. In the... The 40s and the 50s, we, we know tape recorders. And if you picked up a tune, you might be listening for another. You might hear it on the radio. And the older people were teaching the younger people the, the dancing and the songs. And there was a fiddle in the house or a tin whistle. They, they taught us the tunes. And every second or third house had that at the time because there was 
no telephones or televisions. Sorry. And they had to remember tunes. So we had to remember mm. them. Yes. Um, it strikes me that, that do, your, do your children know each other do, uh, during the years of the Dubliners? Yeah, actually, actually I was talking to Phelan Drew about this mm. recently, and he said a lovely thing. He said that the Dubliners, for him growing up, became a kind of an extended family. You know, and Ronnie's kids and my kids and the whole, the whole lot, all the kids know each other and they often have nights out together now and that kind of thing, you know. Siobhan and Cleena meet up for that time and have lunch and that kind of but thing. But of course the group buttered all their parsnips, as they say, <laughs> through the years. You must look at it like that. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Would, would, you, would you talk to me a little about the amount of money through the years you have spent on lawyers drawing up your contracts and putting, oh. in, well, you, putting in very uh, tight conditions <clears throat> governing every member oh, of the group? Oh yeah, we had a manager one time. Did you? <clears throat> we never had a contract up to that point. But uh, Noel Pearson, Noel yeah. Pearson called us in one day and said, listen lads, we should formalise this whole arrangement. And he got a lawyer to draw up a contract, the most convoluted thing I ever saw. Because <laughs> it bound me to Ronnie and Barney and Luke, and then bound Luke to <laughs> Ronnie and Barney and me, and everybody was bound to all the other four. Yes. And then the five of us were bound to Noel. Yes, are you all following this? We ask <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes. So Luke, Luke was looking at this, and he said, for Jesus' sake, he said, yes. if somebody wants to leave this group, they're going to march off in the morning. I don't care what contract you have. So Noel tore it up and said, okay, we'll go on the way we were. <laughs> no contracts? No contracts, never. And, and you never actually joined the group? Well, no, for not formally, anyway. I was never asked to join, but... No. And, 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 so, and so you've never been fired from the group? Well, I can't be, you see, that's the thing. Why? <laughs> because I was never asked to join, so they that's can't true. ask me to leave. <laughs> see, see. I never thought of that, John. Well, good. can I show you something now? I have a little note here of a piece of tape dating from 1963, right. which is a year after this place went on the air for the first time in 1962. Mm -hmm. Have a look at this, your first appearance on television. Ah, right. Of the dogs. When work in a sweat has had a be bet When the Russian sick and cold And shuddering jams up in the hydro dams Or underneath the Thames in a hole I've grabbed it hard and I've got to make hard And many a gangers missed across my ears If you play in your life, don't join my God with my girlfriend I think, um, I think 1963, I think that was from a show called The Balladeers. Lovely to see you. How are you, Paddy? Paddy Thank Riley, you. ladies and gentlemen, here he is. <laughs> Thank you to you to the dog. Now, how, how long did you do with them, Paddy? Um, I joined them for a tour that lasted 10 years. <laughs> Yeah. Ten year tour. Ten that's, years. That's yeah. good. Why? Who had who had opted out at that stage? Well, uh, Ronnie had um, had had left the group uh, to seek a solo career once again. Right. And uh, I've been over thirty years a solo career. So uh, John approached me to, to to see would I go with the boys for a tour, and I did. And as I said, it lasted ten years. It was <clears throat> it was kind of a selfish thing on my part. I loved the Dubliners because uh, when they played at Hoth on Saturday night. I lived out in the Sagard, where your good wife comes from, That's and I worked true. in the paper mills there. And uh, I had a Volkswagen, and I used to walk to work every morning at five o'clock, so it had enough money for petrol to go to the house on Saturday night to see the dubs. <laughs> yeah. And that, it, it went back that far. Yes. So when John asked me to join the dubs, it was quite an honor. And as I said, I was 30 odd years a solo act, and mostly in America, and I'd be I'd sung in every state in America, and I was very ignorant about Europe. I'd never been to sort of Berlin, Hamburg, Vienna, or any of those places. So it was a wonderful opportunity for me to see that, that part of the world, which I enjoyed immensely, I have to say. So was that a good period of your life? It was wonderful, yeah. It was, it was uh, very, very different, like, because everything is kind of new in America and dressed up, but uh, to experience the real thing and play in the, in the concert halls where, where the great people played. I remember one morning John and I went to a mass, don't panic now, but uh, <laughs> we went to a mass in, in uh, Eisenstadt, John, was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, where Haydn was uh, the organist there and I had a mass. And uh, like that type of thing you would never experience uh, sort of 
it, it just off the cuff like that. It, it was a wonderful time. I enjoyed it very much. So then, why did you leave eventually? Um, did did Ronnie come back? I was getting a bit. I was getting a bit long on the tooth. I, I probably left. Probably left for the same reason as Ronnie. Uh, a lot of travelling. A lot of travelling. A lot of going. And um, like <clears throat> people use the term to me, but I take. I, I take exception to it. They say you, t you took over from, from Ronnie. You, you couldn't replace Ronnie Drew. It wasn't possible to replace Ronnie Drew. Like, it wasn't possible to replace Luke Kelly. Um, they were the unique article. So uh, it was quite an honor for me to be with the boys. I had a great time for 10 years. But the reason I left was basically I was tiring of the road. Yeah. Do you say a prayer of thanks every night for Athan Rye? I, uh, uh, and twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a very fortunate song for me, I think yeah. That's, I think that's very I, wise. I had a wonderful time. Wonderful time. It. it was very good to me. <clears throat> Jimmy Keevney, how are you doing? How God you save you. Sir. What, you. What did these boys mean to you through your life? Well, Gay, I must be going back, i say, 40 years at least. I said a good friend of mine there, John Dulgool. We, have, we were up in the... Uh, following from the Royal Hotel in Holt, all the way over to Mick McCarthy's place in the Embankment. <laughs> And we had some great times. And I always remember uh, the Gay Theatre. They were doing Finnegan's Wake. And the pillar was blown down, let's say, three or four days before it. And everybody was wondering where Nelson's head was. <laughs> so I the show see, goes on I in the gate. see disaster looming here. You know, just... The show goes on in the gate. Yeah. And who brings on the head? was either Ronnie or Luke, and there it was. Now, how the hell they found her, I don't know. <laughs> or did they buy it? And I say, I don't know where it is now. I'll never forget it, but I followed Dublin for 40 years, okay, and I got great enjoyment out of them. And even when Paddy was there, and then you have Patsy and Sean now, they're still the same to me. Uh, J Jimmy Kelly, how are you? I can't get up there to okay. shake hands with you, but I said hello earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, Luke's brother, you're, mm -hmm. you're very welcome, and thank, thank you. you for joining us. And the other this Kelly members of the Kelly family. And the other right? members of the Kelly family. Yeah. There you are. Anyway, it's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, what have you got to say to us? You, you, you remember all of those things. Well, I was there from the very start as well. Royal Hotel, as Jimmy Keevney was saying, the embankment on Monday night. Um, it's been a long bereavement with Luke. Yes. And I think it manifests itself in many ways of uh, hearing him so often on the, on the radio, people requesting him singing, and uh, people that I get to know, my other members, uh, the Kelly family, that when they get to know who we are, they, they, they embrace us, the, you know, the fact that, 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 we're, that, that we were members of the Kelly, that we're brothers of Luke. Can I stop you there, yeah. and I'll come back to you in a right. few minutes, because I want to take a break here for a little, a, a few reels, isn't that right, Dara? And I have to get this right now, because we're joined by Sean Keane, Jerry O'Connor, Lima Mwain Lee, and Sharon Shannon for a couple of reels, ladies and gentlemen. Here they are. Here we go. Here we go. Play it in.
my favourite Dubliner song is undoubtedly Raglan Road. Um, I do a, an effort at it at parties and it goes down well. And I always think of the link between Paddy Kavna and the Dubliners in O'Donoghue's pub. It brings back all those memories. So undoubtedly Raglan Road is the favourite. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. For one night only, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Dubliners, and I want to start by showing you this little piece of tape. My understanding is, and I think I'm right in saying it, that this was Luke's very last television appearance. If you roll it there, Alan, please. Wake up, wake up, love. It is thine own true love. Wake up, wake up. Jimmy Kelly, you're getting a little upset when you see that. Well, wonderful singing, and particularly the song. Uh, yeah, it, 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 you, you get a bit choked, there's no doubt about it. Now, it's, it's the first time it's happened to me, but, uh, well, that's the kind of effect he has on you. And, uh, Gay, if I could maybe just uh, quote the great Con Hulan. And I think it sort of says everything about the Dubliners and Luke in particular, but it says, just the last paragraph, he was asked to write a piece. He said, the Dubliners were all individualists. It was Luke and Ronnie and Kieran and John and Barney were leaves of, from different trees, blown together by the wind that changed the world of music a generation ago. What they had most in common were, was artistic honesty. Luke's ambition was to express the song of his loneliness. He succeeded as much as a mortal can, and in doing so, he became an immortal. Connie Hurahan. We would run and the quintessentially Luke song will now be sung for us by Liam Omwain Lee, August Mary Coughlin. <laughs> on Raglan Road. On an autumn day I saw her first and knew uh, That her dark hair would weave a snare That I might one day I saw the danger, yet I walked along the enchanted way. And I said, let grief be a falling leaf at the dawning of on Grafton Street in November, we trip lightly along the ledge of a deep ravine where can be seen. The world of passion's pledge The queen of hearts Still making towns And I not making hay Oh, I love too much and by such, by such, 
is happiness thrown away. I gave her gifts of the mind. I gave her the secret sign that's known to the artists who have known the true gods of sound and stone and a word intent I did not stint for I gave her poems to say and her own and her dark hair like clouds over fields in May on a quiet street where all those meet I see The time has come, my friends, for us to say farewell. I just want to ask you, John, what are the plans for a celebration for the 50th year, or is there one? Uh, well, the main thing, I think, to quote is one, one of Bernie's sayings. Yes. That it's... Uh, what is it, Bernie? Too late to stop now. <laughs> Too late to stop now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, well, we're going to finish up the year with a couple of gigs in Vicar Street. They're always, they're always nice gigs well, after Christmas. Sure. Of course, yes. And uh, we're going to start next year, of the official 50th uh, gigs, the first, the first of them will be in Christchurch for part of the Dublin Trad Fest we're doing tonight in Christchurch with special guests there. So After that we're doing England, the Albert Hall, we're back in. Well, wow. <laughs> there you go, you see, that's in March. That's it? the 13th of March. March and thereabouts. And from there we're all over Europe. Okay. And yeah. what have you to say at this stage to your fans? Well, on behalf of the Dubliners. Well, the fans but are great here tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. It's easy to know we're all related. A lot of relations here. But you're great. So I'd like to say, without you, we'd be playing we to ourselves. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for being here throughout all the years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's go down the line. Eamon, have you any last word to say? Just a, 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 a... Well, it's been a great 25 years for me so far, so I'm looking forward to the next 25. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Patsy. Well, uh, well, what about you, Patsy? Just God bless and good health to each and every one of you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Well I really done. enjoyed the show here. Good. Thanks very That's much for a lovely audience. Well, uh, John said it's the 50th year, but I don't think we're going to stop there. We'll, we'll keep going on, uh, until we, we'll bop till we drop. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get that from? <laughs> what, what Barney, what about you, please? A final word. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you see 
I'm over the 50 years now. You are. And I'm 70 plus fat. <laughs> um, Value added. So, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but John, you're still the elder, are you? I'm, yeah, I am. A few months, yeah. I think we have about 300 years between us all. <laughs> it's only 50 second year. <coughs> but before we had the group, Brian and myself used to be, when it opened in too. Yes. 62, was it? Yes. Yeah. 62. Yeah, you're well, 50 next go. year as well. We're, yeah. we're celebrating yeah. our 50th birthday. Yeah, Can so. I tell them about the, 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 the most polite message I ever got in my, in my career? <laughs> yes. We did the 25th anniversary of the Dubliners, and you're, it was it, it, beginning to go down slide slightly. And as I explained to our audience here in the studio, it was one of the most successful late late shows we ever did, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Dubliners. And they could have packed every hall in Ireland for the ensuing six months, but unfortunately, they'd made arrangements to go, do a tour in Germany. So no, they were. No, it was We couldn't help it yet. Yeah, you had to go. You had no, to go. Yeah. They are the things. They know exactly what time they're going out. Absolutely. <laughs> Three yeah. years to come, you know. Ab I know yeah. that. I know yeah. that. So you went off the next day to Germany, and the following week I got a picture postcard from Berlin addressed <laughs> to me in RTE, and it simply said, Thanks, Head, for the remold, Ronnie. <laughs> 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 and that was it. That was it. Really good. Today, that, that's all we have to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, and we are now. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and all happiness to you on this festive season from everybody in the Dubliners and everybody associated. I've only one chance to get this right because we are now joined for the finale, wait for it, by Mary Co Coughlin, Liam O'Mwain Lee, Declan O'Rourke you've already met, Sharon Challen you've already met, Sean Keane has been here, Jerry O'Connor, Mr. Shane McGowan to play us out with the Shane Dubliners. Shane, Shane, Shane McGowan, he is, yes. Paddy Riley. Yeah. Paddy Riley. <laughs> Paddy Riley. Come up. Come up, Paddy. Are you there? Don't <laughs> Swear I will play the wild 